Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. John Nordlinger, I'm in Microsoft Research. I'm responsible for enhancing computer science curriculum. And I'm very pleased to announce Yolanda Rankin. Yolanda Rankin has recently given a talk that was very well received at SIGSI this summer. She now is presenting here the same theme of that talk, which is how to teach foreign language or a second language within a massively multiplayer game. This is a great idea, one I shared with the folks at Northwestern, and I really think it has enormous potential. So thank you very much, both for attending and for watching remotely, and let's welcome Yolanda Rankin. <laughs> Good afternoon. Thank you, John, for that grace, gracious introduction. I'm going to primarily focus on the results of a study in which we used a popular role-playing game to assist us with evaluating second language acquisition. So typically, when we're thinking along the lines of second language learning, we think of teaching methodology that embraces the student's ability to develop proficiency skills and the areas of writing, speaking, and listening. So this problem is one that you find in any foreign language classroom in which we're trying to basically understand one another. We want to be able to communicate and be able to communicate in a meaningful manner. So what happens in your traditional classroom setting is that teachers often have this complex problem of getting students to interact with one another in the classroom setting. It's all about saving face. And we call this more the ego permeability theory, where I don't want to make mistakes in front of my friends, I don't want to look bad. But this can be a hindrance for those students who are trying to develop their oral proficiency skills in the target domain. So typically, what's happened in the past is that research has shown us that computers can serve a useful role in second language pedagogy. Now, in particular, we have two main camps of thought. We're thinking along the lines of traditional language learning software. This is things that provide self-paced modules to the user that focuses on those four distinct areas of reading, writing, speaking, and listening. Examples of this include Rosetta Stone. On the other hand, you have computers that serve as facilitators for communication. In a foreign language classroom setting, you're thinking of the pen pal that's a native Spanish speaker that you're conversing with via email or a classroom online discussion in which a teacher actually initiates discussion and students participate in that thread. So here we see that we have, once again, traditional language learning software, and on the other hand, you have the computer as a means for communicating with others. What we're proposing is that computer games can help to bridge this gap, keep students in what we call a non-threatening environment, and support them in terms of developing their second language proficiency skills. So, of course, there's various types of games that are out there, various genres. There's puzzle games, real-time strategy. What we began to focus on was the unique benefits that massive multiplayer online role-playing games can provide and to map those strategies to what we call second language pedagogy. So here we're looking at a scene, two scenes, of a popular game developed by Sony Online Entertainment, EverQuest 2. So this game is a fantasy world which is actually parallel to EverQuest, but it's not a sequel. And in this game, students take on various roles. In specific, they become what we call engaged learners. And of course, this is critical in the learning environment, the classroom environment. You don't want students to be passive. You want them to, of course, participate. So what this game allows students to do is to take on the role of an avatar and that they must initially spit, choose a specific particular species or in profession, and that particular avatar represents them in the virtual world of NORAF, a world in EverQuest 2. Here we're looking at a frog lock, an example of specific species, and the frog lock has superior upper body strength, and of course, fights all that is good and noble. So here, once again, students are 
encouraged to be committed to what we call successful character progression. And this starts from the beginning of the game as who they determine to be their particular character. In this scene, which is actually taken from a pilot study that we did this spring, we have two characters. The one that's standing is known as what's called an erudite. This is a person that is concerned with intellect and acquisition of knowledge and wisdom. And the character that's on the, sitting on the ground is known as a halfling. And what's going on in this particular scene is they've just completed combat with a goblin known as a sapswill warrior. And so the erudite, in this case, has the profession of being a wizard. And the wizard has the ability to use their magical powers of fire and ice, in this case, to heal their friend who is sitting on the floor. So she's replenishing her energy as she uh, is recovering from battle. Now, once again, the idea here is that the things that these students do in the game support active engagement. In other words, the things they do reflect the choices and the outcome that happens in the game. Another benefit that MMORPGs give students is the ability to participate in this virtual realm. This virtual realm in which all the information that you hear is in that target language and the information is displayed on the screen. Now in this scene, this happens to be the French version of EverQuest 2, in which we have at the lower bottom of your screen a Kara, similar to a tiger, in which the character is talking to Captain Pinuous. Pinuous is a non-playing character a character that is not responsible for completing tasks in the game, but has crucial information that can assist playing characters as they complete quests. Now, if you notice the options on the right side, there's basically five options. And so what the game does is provide scaffolding measures that allow the user to choose the appropriate response. So this gives a reinforcement of information visually as well as orally. And this, of course, maps back to the idea that as you play this game, you're being immersed in this environment in which language is crucial to your progression in the game. In this scene, we have, once again, a wealth of information that's displayed on the screen. But in this case, it pertains to game development, game progression. So there's various levels in which they can go from 1 to 60. And the lower portion of the screen, this gives you a list of the abilities that you've attained through your character while at the top left corner, you see your health status. So once again, not only is language displayed, but the information that the game provides you as feedback about your character development is crucial to understanding and doing well within, once again, the game of EverQuest 2. The third benefit that we found ideal for second language learning and that role-playing games provide is this inherent design of social interactions. Now, unlike your typical other genres, Role-playing games are not concerned with winning. It's more about being. So in this virtual space, it's important to take on the characteristics of your character as well as to hone their skills. Well, one of the ways in which you do this is you develop affiliations with other players in the game. These affiliations are critical because as you realize through the course of playing this game, if you are to proceed various levels, then you need partnerships, you need affiliations with others. So here we have a scene in which two characters, playing characters, are simply greeting one another on their first day of interacting in our study. And the second scene, what we have here is just a sample of the chat log that's going on between these two characters. This refers back to our erudite and our halfling. And this example, the erudite is telling the halfling to take the quest and to wait for her. And the quest in this case is to kill the filed scout. And I'm not sure if you can see that, but if you look in the center of the screen, there's a dead body lying on the ground. So what happens here is that they're negotiating via the chat window in terms of what we're going to do next and, of course, how to proceed. And as a result of them deciding to work together, they're able to defeat their foe. But at the same time, notice the interaction, feedback. They're dangerous. Thank you. Acknowledging support and help. And let's move on to the next task. So role-playing games provide a rich arena in which second language students can actually practice generating the language, and they can also flex their skills in learning to once again understand one another and that target domain. So what this led us to do was to first of all decide to do exploratory study that allows us to understand 
if EverQuest 2 is really ideal for second language learning. So we want to address these questions and use these questions as a framework for the pilot study that we did this spring. The first question is, does EverQuest 2 support second language learning? Two, as a result of gameplay, do we see where these students show a learning gain as a result of engaging in gameplay for a sustained period of time? And third, you want to have a better sense of how to develop games that actually support second language learning at the same time embracing pedagogy without, of course, sacrificing the element of fun. So these are things that framed our framework, and we began to once again look for a specific student population to do this. So we decided that English as Second Language would be the easiest sample population to work with at Northwestern since we have students that are there taking classes and want to improve their English speaking skills. And we use the assessment of basic English skills tests, known as BEST, and English as a Foreign Language Test, the TOEFL, to identify our sample population. Now, this is a small sample size, but nonetheless exploratory in nature and enough to give us sufficient direction as to what to do for future steps. We were able to identify four advanced ESL students, one intermediate ESL student, and then there was one student that was, interestingly enough, on the border of being a beginner and intermediate. So oftentimes when you take assessments, some students don't necessarily test squarely in one bracket or another. You find that some are particularly on a border. But we felt that this variety of English proficiency skills background would give us some kind of insight as to which audience would be better suited for using this game for language learning. As we proceeded with our game study, we also decided that to assist students with the built-in partnerships that RPGs support, that we would arrange them in groups of twos. So they would have a built-in partner that was playing the game with them, who also had the same goal of improving their English second language skills. Yes? Uh, what does it mean to be beginner, intermediate, or advanced for ESL? So an advanced ESL student is someone that basically can hold a conversation with you without needing a dictionary or asking for a lot of repetitive phrases to understand what you're saying. An intermediate student is comfortable holding a conversation on a limited basis, but may require you to repeat phrases repeatedly, a use of dictionary when reading, things of that nature. A beginner has limited knowledge. They may have basic vocabulary, basic conversation stars like, hello, how are you? But they're not comfortable having a conversation with a native English speaker and tend to refrain from that. So that's pretty much how you identify these different classifications, yes. Were these students in an English-speaking country or elsewhere? Here in the United States, uh, some of them were actually students at Northwestern, and some had been students at Northwestern at one time or another, but were still living in the area. But they were not taking, uh, at the time, official ESL classes. But had taken them in the past, yes. When you, when you said that the students were arranged in dyads, were they playing co-located next to one another? So, yes, I was actually moving to that next point. So what happens in the study, and once again, this idea of partnerships, and we know that foreign language students are weary of trying to initiate contact with, with a native speaker. We decided that we would have them meet in groups of twos to play the game in a language lab. And what this pretty much involved was a commitment to play the game for at least four hours a week for the next 10 weeks. Now the first week and a half we devoted to a tutorial session. And the reason why we found this necessary was that we actually gave each participant a pre-game questionnaire to get a feel for what their computer literacy background was and if they had ever played games before. And interestingly enough, we found that the females in our group typically had not played games. And so the males in our group had played games. So we felt it necessary to provide a tutorial session in which they would become familiar with the game controls, understand the goals of the game, what a quest is. Also get a chance to play around with different characters. I mean, there's a role of characters that you can pick from. You can always change at free will. And this allowed them to become comfortable with, of course, using EverQuest 2. Now, what this also means is, yes, we had interactions that they actually talked to one another as they were, of course, playing the game as well. So that's pretty much what the scenario or the setting was for this particular pilot study. So the first question, once again, we're looking at this game as a pedagogical tool for language learning. And we want to be able to assess this. And so we decided that we would start with, first of all, understanding what the students themselves thought of the game as a language learning tool. To assess this, we did a pre- and post-game questionnaire 
that actually gave us a lot of insight. And our findings were not too surprising. All students, all six students, agreed and thought that the game was very beneficial for assisting them with their ability to improve their reading and translation skills. And this makes sense. The information is displayed visually on the screen, and they have opportunities to, of course, practice their translation skills. Five out of the six said the game, they thought, was helpful for the vocabulary. And that was not too surprising. But when we only saw that one third of the students thought the game did anything in terms of their speaking and spelling skills, it raised some questions. And the reason why it raised questions for us is that we really assumed that with the chat mechanism, that they would be doing more communication via that manner and would provide the necessary support for improving their writing skills. And that doesn't seem to be the case right here. So this forced a second question. question. I'm sorry, are, these, are these pre or post? This is post. OK. Sorry. Yes, we did a pre game questionnaire, didn't ask them what their goal was, but simply to assess what, how, what their skill set was in terms of background for computer literacy. But as part of the post-game questionnaire, we wanted to understand how they thought the game helped them with their ESL skills. So this led to a second question. What is happening with their writing skills? Why are, why are we not seeing this idea that the game is beneficial for this? I mean, after all, they have the ability to communicate with whatever playing character they would like. But it doesn't seem to be become a realization in terms of their English writing abilities. So we decided to take a closer look at the chat logs and to determine whether or not we're finding syntactical errors and to what extent we're seeing those errors. And perhaps that could begin to help us to understand whether or not this game is well suited for writing or not. So what we found, just to give you an example of what we're looking at here, is we were actually take each student's game log, their chat log, and what you see here in highlighted in yellow is an example of two playing characters, the you being the current person that's typing on the screen, and everything that this person says is being displayed, and we have here what we need to do. Now, the reason why I highlight this particular segment is that I want to show you what counts as a syntactical error. In this case, this is a missing word or a malformed question. So this would count as a tactical area. Now, as she's responding, um, the character, third line down, responds with, bit him. And what she really means to say is bite him. So this counts as a different syntactical error in that it's a misspelled word. So we begin to look at the chat logs, and we found this kind of interesting result. Error messages were jumping up and down going back and forth, which seems to suggest that they're making as many mistakes as they're not making over a period of time. That's to be expected, right? As they're sitting here chatting with one another, they're making errors, and then they're getting better, and then they're, once again, making errors. So it doesn't quite suggest that there's a lot of learning going on. So we decided that we need to actually look at this along the lines of the number of messages that are being generated, and then look at the errors. So we went back to our dyads and decided to actually look at the two dyads and compare them. So what you're looking here is the high-level beginner. Now, this high-level beginner, once again, is on the border of being in a place where they can have a conversation with you or me, and at the same time is developing proficiency in which they rely less on a dictionary or rely less on repetitive phrases. Now, she is generating the least number of chat messages in this study. She's averaging about three sessions, three messages per session. And in the course of this, we see that she's actually making no errors. Now, that sort of suggests, in a way, that perhaps she is actually cognitively very, very conscious of what she's writing. It could be that whatever she's typing, she's looking at the screen to make sure that she actually correct, types the correct thing. So that's a little bit promising, but not, once again, a conclusive result. But enough to let us know that she's probably working very hard at the things that she does type in. She's not just you know, responding or worrying about having a quick response time. Well, our intermediate person, who once again, this is someone that's comfortable having a limited conversation, she's generating more, error, more chat messages. Her errors are also increasing with the number of chat messages and dropping as a result. So this is not an issue of lack of practice or lack of opportunity to type. It seems to be, in this case, that this student may be more concerned with responding in a quick response time. And then the other question that began to arise is, if her partner is only averaging three messages per session, who is she talking to? Because remember, we're thinking they're talking to one another. 
she's generating many more messages. So she's not just talking to her partner anymore. And we found that to be the case, which is a good sign. That's a good sign. Now looking at our advanced ESL dyad, we look at these students who are generating over time an increased number of chat messages and as a result an increased number of error messages. And while we see the number of chat messages drop and error messages drop, we're not able to pretty much determine what's really going on here. But I did begin to ask myself a different question. And this forced me to actually look at the chat logs specifically in terms of one syntactical error category, and that being spelling. Because I began to realize that the students were beginning to use what we call shorthand. It's typical. Instead of saying, typing the letter A-R-E for the word R, you use the letter R. And I began to realize I was finding instances of shorthand in their chat logs. Well, this indicates that they're actually developing two different types of literacy. Sure, there's the English. But they're also developing the literacy that we attribute to the community of people who conversate online, which means this is a positive. So developing skill sets in terms of how they use a computer for communicating in a short turnaround frame, which may be on the surface an error in terms of accuracy, but is not really an error. Okay? And this is just a quick um, snapshot of the, her partner, who's also, once again, an advanced ESL student. Notice how this student, from the very beginning, she is talking a lot. And what I found is that though she talked to her partner, she was the most active participant in talking to other playing characters in the game. She was very comfortable doing that after a very short time frame. And this is actually after the tutorial session. So we see here that the potential in which this game can support writing is there. Perhaps we're not evaluating it in the correct manner. And that begins, of course, to raise other questions. So we want to return back to this idea that games are great for supporting incidental learning. You don't want to compromise this element of fun, but at the same time, you do want them to, to learn something, in this case, ESL skills. So we decided that though this was a pilot study, perhaps there's a way for us to measure the learning outcome in one specific area. And we decided to look at vocabulary. So what we decided to do was to take each student's game log and to actually scrub it using Perl scripts to see what interactions they were having with what we call non-playing characters, characters that had information about the game but are not concerned with completing quests. And this would give us an ability to identify vocabulary words that had a word frequency count of one. So they'd seen this word one time, and we want to see if they have an understanding of what that word means. So we did this test midway through the study, about four weeks. And then we turned around and did it again at the end of the study. This is just a sample game log for one playing character where, once again, the Perl scripts identify potential vocabulary words, words such as island arrangement. And once again, looking at word frequency count of just one, we want to identify those as potential words for evaluation question. And this is for them generating words, not consuming vocabulary? This is for them consuming. Because it, what happens in the game, if you ever play EverQuest 2, the non-playing character's dialogue is canned. So in other words, this is a script that, for some of your characters, you hear voiceovers. At the same time, everything that you hear is displayed on the screen. So in order for them to be able to respond intelligently to what information is displayed, they've got to understand what the NPC is saying to them. So we're looking to see if they have an understanding of vocabulary words that the NPC is introducing to them. So that's why we want to do it per student, per their interactions with their own NPCs. Because each student didn't necessarily do the exact same thing in the game. This was words that were seen at least once or only once? Well, we did all of the vocabulary words. And then we restricted to just vocabulary words of one word frequency count. Only one word frequency count. And then we did the assessment first four weeks. And then uh, we turned around and we did it again. At, at the end of eight weeks. Remember, we're just counting the first week and a half for the tutorial session. The responses here, they're not pre full text, are they? They're just no. from the menu. No. If, uh, if you, I could go back to the slide, but remember, whenever your responses, there's always like three or four options in which you can pick from that will provide a proper response to the NPC. Okay. okay. So here's what we found. First four weeks, Every student had at least 30% accuracy of 
English vocabulary words. Accuracy being defined as the ability to define the word and use it in a sentence correctly. So this was OK. But at the end of the study, we saw that each student at least had 40% understanding of accuracy of those same one word frequency count. Now, the one thing that we're not quite clear on is we didn't double check at the end to see if they had seen the word more often. But the, under, the assumption is that, OK, you had the word four weeks. It's been eight weeks later. Hopefully, by now, you've gained an understanding of what that word means. And we did see an increase there. The second issue that, you, that we have to look at these results and, and step back is say that we have no way of knowing prior to this study if they did not have pre-existing knowledge of these words. But the gameplay seems to suggest that it does help them to gain a better sense of semantics of the word use. And that's a good sign, too. So here's a summary of our results. Though this game is ideal for entertainment, we still want to understand, and we know that it's necessary that when you want to design games to support learning, it's important that you include that up front. Not at the price of compromising fun, but it's important and cru crucial in terms of influencing any kind of learning outcome that you want to have. Now, this comes in response to, of course, future work, which I'll talk about later in the next slide. Secondly, this game is ideal or better suited for an audience of ESL students that are intermediate and definitely advanced. The first week in which we did this pilot study, my intermediate and my high level beginner were of course chatting with one another and her statements for that first day were, it's hard. That's what she wrote. And I watched her for the next two weeks because I was really concerned that she was going to quit because she went from not bringing any kind of dictionary tool to every day coming with a tool to the game. And so this was something that, even though it assisted to her for vocabulary, at first proved to be a daunting task. And I was afraid that I would lose her due to the fact that she was struggling so with understanding the language. So I would probably refrain from using this game for someone that's classified as a beginner ESL student. Last of all, while we cannot say that the game is ideal for improving writing skills, we do believe that there's a way which the game can support that. And so one of the things that we want to look at is actually evaluating the kinds of tactical errors that our non-native English speakers are making and how that compares to native English speakers. So future work. We've already begun the next stage of actually doing a syntactical analysis of the chat logs. And we also want to evaluate the communicative function because we believe that when there is opportunities to just engage in social chit chat, that's when you see the greatest opportunities for the number of chat messages increasing. But when students are involved in combat, there is no time to sit down and type in, oh yes, I need help. And what this results in, of course, is where you saw the decreased number of chat messages as students engage in combat. Um, but once again, this needs to be closely investigated. So the next thing that we want to do, this is a response to the post-game questionnaire, things that they gave us feedback as to how to make this game more effective for language learning. We want to actually implement a plug-in on top of EverQuest, too, so that there's a built-in tool, like a Pictionary, if you will, that will provide the actual additional scaffolding so that words that are unfamiliar or they're not quite sure what it means, they can simply, within the game, pull up that tool and look it up. And this could be in the form of highlighted vocabulary as a separate window. And more importantly, we want to continue this work with a full-blown formal study in which we have a control group that doesn't play the game, but of course is, is interested in increasing their ESL skills. And we want to compare that to a group of students that actually play this game and to see if we can see actual learning games in comparison between the two groups. And this is the part in which um, I'm really looking for support and collaboration because the hardest part for me right now is actually getting people to want to not play the game, but getting that specific population of students that want to learn another language, getting them to play the game, finding that student. That's what I'm looking for. And so I know that some of the things that you do here at Microsoft Research involve accessibility to people that actually play games and perhaps would like to work on their second language skills in whatever domain. Now EverQuest 2 supports French, German, Japanese, American, and British English. So there's a wealth of opportunities in which we can look at specific target languages and how that can support second language learning. In conclusion, I would like to first of all thank John for having me here. I've really enjoyed my stay today. 
He was the one that actually gave me this idea. As he said, we had a conversation last fall, uh, and it seemed to be an easy sell that you would think of people wanting to have fun and at the same time wanting to learn a language. Secondly, Sec Sony Online Entertainment has been gracious enough to provide us the software licenses. I mean, typically this is a monthly subscription in which you pay and play the game, and they were kind enough to give us enough license to do the study and my contacts there. And last of all, the National Science Foundation, of course, uh, funds this research as well. Any questions? Yes. The previous slide you had, um, that you said the students had recommended, I, I just missed, what was the highlighted vocabulary? So, rather than having them bring their own dictionaries to the actual game lab, they would like to have had a tool that they could actually just, you know, click on, pull it up. Highlight the work to get to the dictionary. So the whole idea is that, it wasn't clear to them, and once again, it's an exploratory study, which vocabulary words they should have been focusing on, right? I mean, there's a lot of information that's being thrown at them. It would have been nice to have some kind of direction as in, hey, I want you to focus on X, Y, Z, and at the end of this gameplay today, we're going to see if you actually understand those words as a result of gameplay. And so your dictionary can actually give you hints as to words that, you need, that provide further information about what it means and how to use it, but the highlight tells you which words you should be paying attention to as well. Are they given it enough that you know putting them behind screens separately uh, confers an advantage versus you know having to play play cards or something? Well, research has shown uh, in terms of Beauvais and um, uh, Payne and Whitman that computers do a wonderful job of masking who we are, and this of course provides a different kind of learning environment, especially for those introverted learners, and it also provides a more democratic one. So the idea is that we're hoping that with them being in this faceless environment, even though they have a game avatar represents them, that that will take away some of the inhibitions that they will experience in a classroom setting. Now, I don't know to what extent the results of, say, for example, a group that plays this game would compare to someone else taking an ESL class or even using traditional language learning software. That's the next step. That's why we want to do the formal study, because we want to actually measure those two tracks to see if there's a significant improvement for those who play the game versus those who do traditional classroom setting. Yeah, yeah, sure probably already studied uh, you know, vocab tapes and you know, memorizing out of a book and such. And I, I, I have no idea what the, you know, what sort of the standard, standard rates are. Well, what, what I do know from uh, the lit review that uh, I did in preparation for this work is that they've, the studies have shown that computers as uh, online forums or email do support students having le greater learning gains for foreign language, but nothing along the lines of here's a comparison between those who typically do a classroom learning process versus those who participate in an online discussion board. And I know that there have been some studies done on games that use those traditional methodologies, um, like I think it was Word Blaster, yeah, you know, like yes. that, where, where they found that even where, whereas immediately after the kids can do and, and succeed on tests, they actually don't retain the, the, the words uh, that well. So there's a high degradation in, um, in that learning, so it would be interesting to see, too. I mean, there's a lot of research that suggests that when, when people use language in context, yeah. that they do a better job of sure. retaining it. So this is this was interesting to me about this. Right. And the other thing that's interesting, too, is, you know, even if it came out that this was a little bit slower way of expanding vocabulary, it's also one that is more likely to be self-motivated, yeah. whereas, you know, having to go to a, so that's, that's what's intriguing. No. Question. A few weeks ago, a uh, month ago here, we had a talk where the speaker was studying, I think, World of Warcraft, and said that about a third of the game experience was what you get from installing it and playing it on the computer. The majority of the game experience was the social interactions with your guild masters and with the web forums and uh, the hints and stuff in the web. Have you had thoughts about going beyond the game into those? Um, I did. The issue there is IRB. So I cannot, like, there's a wealth of information, in fact, a wealth of data available in the forums. But I have to get each forum person to sign an IRB so that I can actually look at that data. But you see, 
multiple instances in which people are communicating um, new, for long periods of time and just hanging out, socializing. Great idea. I just don't think I could get it to, to, to I can get those people to pass through IRB, but it's something I would like to do. And I don't know how difficult. When I came to Sony, because I actually had the same idea um, at the end of the spring, why not take the people who are in forums? This is what they do, right? And basically, Sony said that they couldn't give me any kind of, of leeway to use that. I would have to still go through individually and get their permission in order to look at that data and to use that as part of the study. OK. Uh, you had an example earlier of uh, bit him, and you called that a typo or a misspelled word. I was wondering how you determine that as opposed to uh, them confusing a command versus like the simple past tense. Oh, there's the com command bit is it's not a... Bit, yeah. Yeah, you about this. Yeah. Yeah. So why... So uh, why did you decide it was a typo or a misspelled word as opposed to confusing the verb tense? Uh, that's a good question. Um, that's a good question. It, it could actually go either or. You're right, it could be. Three things. It could either be bit him, uh, it could have been uh, hit him as a typo, or it could have been bit him a correct past tense. Um, <laughs> what you don't see is that she repeats this, this, mis this, this okay. misspelled word twice. And for the sake of, I just took out the, the, the repetitiveness. So I, I think she intended to say, at least bite, not hit. Or and bit him, it could be a, a matter of tense. I'm not sure. This is the reason why I begin to realize that we need to do a more fine-grained analysis of the syntactical errors. Because once again, when we first looked at this, we just said, if it's incorrect, it's an error. And then I begin to realize, you know what, I've got to break this up into more significant categories. Because what's happening here is that I need to understand what kind of error is it. And that's the part that we actually just started at the beginning of this summer. So this, to me, this looks remedial and almost trivial. But then if I think about doing this in French or a different language, it really seems incredibly welded. I mean, you can find great information about language pattern, mistakes, it just seems great. I assume you're editing logs that Sony provides in the directory with that request that they capture the chat somehow? Basically, you can um, turn on the, the game log and you can log everything that, that you do in the game and we just pretty much run those through our Perl scripts. Does, does, could your research support the claim that in learning language in this environment, the more mistakes you learn, the more mistakes you make, the faster you learn. Not sure. I mean, that is one of the ideas in terms of second language methodology, that you can't learn without making mistakes, or for any kind of learning, that you can't learn without making mistakes. Um, you could see this as a means of doing error detection and looking at the rate in which it increases or decreases, and then, of course, breaking down to the kind of categories. For the question that he raised in terms of what kind of syntactical error, one of the ways we could begin to address that question is looking at this one specific PC's game logs and looking to see the number of times that they have issues with subject verb agreement, if it's a tense issue, versus actual misspelled words. And that will help us to begin to a answer that question. Okay. Yeah. One follow up to his question. The thought comes to mind that in a sort of larger scale study with perhaps a full classroom of students across a semester or in multiple classrooms, you could set up your own guild that all of them participated in and have another channel which allows them to talk, you know, across more than just the local person they're sitting next to. Exactly. And then my, my question based on that was these participants were sitting side by side in a language lab. Right. So obvious question there is how much did they get away from using the keyboard and typing in English? speaking Spanish or whatever the native language was? It proves to be a problem. And one that, once again, at the beginning of the study, I, I began to realize was a, uh, a major hindrance in their writing ability in terms of writing in a chat window. We know moving forward that we don't want them to be co-located. Um, the reason why, if you refer back to the student, this one, the reason why she generated the most messages than anybody else is that she started talking to people other than her partner. And when she began to do that, you see that she just, she's all over the place in terms of being more than 40 messages per session. And so, of course, this leads us to understand if we want to run an effective study that actually promotes writing abilities, we can't have them co-located. Because this is going to allow you to actually get the practice that you need in generating that text and communicating with one another. So, definitely. But then that raises the issue of resources because we're, we're limited to the fact that we need 
sophisticated machines to run graphics, and those machines are in a certain place, and everybody has those. Because one of the suggestions that one of the professors made was, it would be lovely if we could do this on laptops. That way they can be at home, wherever they want to be, log in, play the game, wealth of data, you get more stuff, and of course that becomes a high-end issue. So did anybody ever offer corrections to typos or anything? I know when I'm working with a non-native English speaker, um, I will generally help them to, to form a sentence correctly or something like that so that they're improving their skills as they go. Is there any type of help online that way? Um, Especially when you get like shortcuts and stuff, you just assume they know what they're doing when they put an R instead of an A-R-E or something. The help that I did see in the chat logs dealt more with game character. How do you do this? How do I use this weapon? That's what I saw in the chat logs. I didn't see instances of, okay, you, you type this incorrectly. But I also suspect that that was probably part of the conversation that happened sitting next to each other in verbal that we didn't catch in the game logs. Toward the end of the talk, there's one slide talking about, you know, the game design include uh, language pedagogy, uh, pedagogies up front. Would you elaborate on that? I, I, I actually didn't really feel so, that language pedagogy part. So this game obviously has no such uh, language pedagogy as a basis for its design. And what we're talking about, so one of the things we want to do in the next phase of our research is to design our own game module uh, so that it does encompass second language teaching methodology. This is something that EverQuest 2 is not going to invest money in doing. We wouldn't expect them to. But, but so, so this whole idea of an immersive environment, that's one of the second language teacher methodologies where all you hear is that language and everything you do is in that language and everyone speaks that language and you're participating in interactions with native speakers. That's the second language teaching methodology, a methodology in which you're giving feedback about the things that you are saying or typing. That's also uh, a second language te teaching methodology. So the game does not provide any kind of means in which you can assess that I typed this correctly or I didn't. The idea was that the other players would give you that, but perhaps the idea of having the information available, once again, as a plug-in via an example of how to use that word, serves as an example of correct usage, which is a second language methodology, is feedback to the user for correcting their mistakes or errors. Does that make sense? Not quite? So if I understand what you're saying, you'd like to create your own kind of environment which has a lot of these kinds of attractive and interactive capabilities, but which is more controlled by you to be properly pedagogical in terms of teaching language, right? The obvious question that implies is, have you found any technologies, tools, uh, game engines that you've started looking into that would actually do this? Well, one of the things that came up in a discussion today with John was I'm actually interested in some of the tools that Microsoft Research produces so that I don't have to spend uh, three or four years trying to develop my own game. That's a, a major undertaking. And so the idea here is to use perhaps some of the tools that Microsoft develops as a game engine to actually put our module on top of that and to get us up and running. The other issue, and this came up at SIGGRAPH, teachers, uh, and these are language teachers, they're not necessarily computer scientists, and they don't necessarily program. So this whole idea that it has to be a tool that's easy to use, that I can put in your hand and you can customize it, is something that they're willing to listen to as long as it doesn't require a whole lot of work. So my, my goal is to actually give them that kind of tool in their hand. But at the same time, I don't want to change it into traditional language learning software. I want it to still preserve the aspects of this is fun, I don't mind spending hours and hours playing this. Because the outcome of this game, for each and every person in my study was they became an EverQuest 2 player. In other words, they can they play the game even today. So I have converts. I just don't know if their ESL skills are steadily improving as a result because I'm not measuring that anymore. But they definitely found the game to be fun and would, on their own free time, on the weekends, whenever, would still play the game. And, and, st and, and that in itself speaks to the motivation that games provide. Still in English. Still in English. Still in English. Yeah. So can you just call them back in and ask them if they're learning playing the game? Or? Actually, uh, I, I, I've reserved the right to say, hey, can you help me? And they said, yeah, they'll help me. Uh, but I'm just glad to see Are that. Are still all on campus now? Huh? No. In the summers, uh, two of them went to Europe. They'll be back. Um, one moved off campus, actually out of Evanston, but I have access. I know where they they'll live. They'll be there in the fall. Morning. Some of them will. Some of them will be working in the area. Yeah. So there, there are a number of things that you talked about that um, it make me think that looking at Second Life 
as a as a different game would be if not beneficial, then at least offer an alternative perspective. Because you mentioned that while well, they're in combat, they're not talking, and so they're not learning. And in Second Life, you don't have combat. Second Life, the whole emphasis is on social interaction and things like that. And also, I know that Second Life is very extensively customizable. I mean, you can buy your own piece of land and build a house and write whatever scripts you want. Um, once again, it's it's a huge learning hurdle for teachers of ESL classes, but it might be something else to pursue. Well, so this came up once again in a conversation with John today that I actually looked at Second Life as an option for perhaps future work for those very reasons, because it's once again another life in another world, and it's less about killing or uh, doing other things or completing quests. So I had thought about that. Um, the only issue I, I would have with that is I'm not quite sure that the environment of Second Life would provide enough structure so that they get the kind of interaction that would support second language learning. So at least with EverQuest, everything that you do, the language is, sec is crucial. It does play a secondary role, but it's crucial to, to game progression. So what, um, one of the things that you could, we didn't look at, but you could think about is how quickly did students progress to different levels? Like one through nine is typically a newbie, but all of our students got beyond that pass, that, that, um, that threshold, and actually some faster than others. Our ESL students always, our advanced ESL students had the greatest progression and were off the island in no time compared to the diet of the high level beginner and intermediate. So there's all kinds of learning that's going on here, and I don't want to say that, um, let me create an environment that's strictly you know, focusing on interactions, but because some of that learning, even though it's about the game, it does map to ESL skill set still. So, but that is definitely an ideal suggestion. Thinking about it, but I definitely want the structure to be there. Because here's where the game, uh, second language pedagogy comes into play. How do I do that in second life so that they get the kind of reinforcement and desired skill sets that I want them to improve or to gain? And that's where you talk about that. So uh, the MISC style games, which are not um, social, but you adventure. You yeah, you learn things and you learn how to break codes and stuff like that. Is that a perhaps fruitful way to learn a language and progress? Uh, I, I mean, I think it would be. I just uh, I think because I had the willingness of Sony to support this, and uh, I actually played around with EverQuest two myself before deciding to do this. Uh, I thought it was just better suited for that. But it doesn't mean that other genres would not work. Um, EverQuest 2 is unique because it has a huge investment in voice actors. A lot of games have done that. They've invested so much in voice actors to actually hear the language, and they have a lot of dialogue. So because of that, you get to have the iterative process of hearing somebody speak, seeing the print, and having that sort of digestible experience. You can also repeat you know, the experience to get the words to understand what's going on. And some genres don't support that repetitive. I need to go back and practice. Any other questions? This one seems narrow-minded, but I really associate massively multiplayer games with decreased literacy, <laughs> decreased language skills, writing, and incoherent sentence construction. <laughs> are you going to reach the a level where you have to actually curtail their use to stop it getting worse? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Uh, I, that's a good question. And that goes back to the chat logs. You're not really speaking in complete sentences. Uh, it's not about this uh, syntactical structure. So that, that definitely would be an issue for those who are practicing uh, writing in the chat window. And that's more of an issue or a symptom of having to quickly respond to, to the person that you're talking to. But uh, until I see any kind of learning curve, uh, I don't think it's, a, it's a, an immediate problem to address just yet. But that is something that, um, would be a criticism for just say, if you want to use this game to help promote just literacy skills of any kind for any English speaking class, period. And you want to measure, does this game support uh, syntactical accuracy? Then yeah, you run into those issues. Um, but that's the same argument we say, like do people who type this way in this particular context, does that mean they can't write outside of that context? I think yeah, you, you, ad you adapt. I've seen people speaking business emails at Microsoft and I find it unbelievable. <laughs> I, I'm not sure I quite buy the argument that this decreases. Um, the argument is, does SMS 
somehow threaten someone's innate vocabulary. I don't know if there's been research on that. Yeah, but it's I don't know if I buy that. I mean, I use shorthand all the time, but of course I know how to write, so I, I guess it depends on what your, your starting point is in terms of literacy. The proposition is that SMS would eventually become non-distinguishable from real language if you've done, if you've done it enough. And I don't know if that's possible. Jason, do you know that? SMS? Uh, when you type on phones, you type short messages or something? No, I don't do phone messages. It seems like, I mean, one of the problems, I've, I've, I'm doing some work on, on English language, or second language acquisition too, and as you start to break it down, you realize that there are many, many skills. It's, I mean, as you start to try to think of targeting skills through software, right, there's, and so th that seems like what you're talking about, is you develop, it's not that you degrade other skills, but maybe you develop such high competency in one particular skill that it becomes your preferred mode of communication and then can handicap your development of the others because it's so far ahead of those. And so I can see that becoming a problem if you know you are familiar with a certain kind of informal chat style and then you go to write emails or business communications or paper. So this is um, exactly the argument. German professor had it on Western. Oh, yes. She saw a German slang and didn't want kids to be infected by that when they were trying to real, learn real German. But again, like I'm saying, it's, just, it's an issue that I think if, if one were to take this broad approach, taking the involvement of pedagogy from the beginning, then in the game design, I think you'd have to build that in and figure out ways to make the other forms of communication. Yes, and just as important. But mm -hmm. yeah, so that you start to look at like reading and, and or under comprehension of English and then you start to realize well there's there's listening comprehension but there's first just listening to be able to distinguish words and sounds and then there's being able to actually understand the meaning of the words and then there's being able to read and understand how to pronounce words and then there's reading and understanding how to understand the meaning of those words and then there's being able to read and being able to summarize what you've just read and all those things are different skills and games that do all of that extremely hard to do. Yes. So, so yes. if anybody has a modest experience in French, I really encourage you to download any play request. Download the Storm's client. You'll be amazed at how fast your French acquisition is refreshed. Mm -hmm. And that that's what first struck me is that it's really startling that if you if you have a, a basis, a foundation, and you download and you, and you experience the words along with the voice that you can hear and the context that you're kind of familiar with because you played in English means that you can get vocabulary and, and sound super fast, much faster than Berlin's or any other mm. online training tool I've seen. The important point about that in EQ2 versus other games and versus doing something like yourself as a teacher for your classroom mm -hmm. is that there's so much content there and they're one of the few games that actually combines the spoken dialogue with the written text. So it's a really cool advantage of the game as it is right now. Any other questions? No? All right, well thank, thank you, you so much for having me.